Some of them uh, often, you know, in their memoirs, sometimes in their diaries, lament the fact that, you know, their parents uh, had the opportunity to actually prove themselves in revolution and in war. They never had that opportunity. Therefore, when the Cultural Revolution came, they, f they thought this was their opportunity. And it was their opportunity to prove themselves as also devoted revolutionaries. Guo Binyang, the book title is uh, The Red Guard Generation and Political Activism in China. The book has uh, two uh, really uh, big stories uh, in it, and both stories uh, are important for understand uh, that history of China, that, which is the Cultural Revolution, and uh, for understanding contemporary Chinese society and politics. Um, so I'll say something about these two stories. So one story is about the whole generation, which I call the Red Guard generation. Some people some, uh, may call it the Cultural Revolution generation. Some people call this the Sand Down generation. Um, I thought the Red Guard generation is uh, it's important in the sense that the Red Guard movement was the most defining um, political experience for this cohort. They uh, threw themselves into the Cultural Revolution with great fervor, and, um, and when they were engaged in acts of violence, they were imagining themselves, uh, they were imagining that they were fighting a real war, and they were proud of being part of that war. Why? Um, the reason uh, uh, could be as simple as saying that it was a part of their education that they received. And that education, both formal school education and informal uh, education through society, through culture, media, films, children's books, uh, novels, um, that's the kind of values they learn, which is you know, about the glory of war and uh, the glory of the Chinese Communist Revolution. And that, in a sense, was understandable uh, about that kind of inculcation of that kind of values because uh, they, as I said, they were the first cohort to grow up in the new, new regime. And the regime was a revolutionary regime. So that was right after the, you know, the, the communist regime uh, came to power. I can give you an example about the kind of um, uh, the, the situation, the war situation um, of that period was about a particular attack, one faction attacking the other faction. So the other faction was, um, has taken hold of their school library. So the opposing faction wanted to take over the, uh, the school library. So they would launch attacks against that faction who was, which was holding the library. And the, the, the person who wrote diary about this, recording what was happening then, was really describing this. He, said, he would say in his diary, well, we were going to launch our attacks, and suddenly I feel like this was like what I've seen in the film. You know, films in films, people were doing things, doing a lot, you know, the soldiers, the heroes were doing, were fighting like this. So we seem to be just doing the same thing that we have learned for. So in that way, you know, in that sense, one of my argument in the book is that they are enacting a drama, a revolutionary drama, which they had learned well through watching films and reading novels and so on. So they, were, they had that kind of vivid sense of on this moment, on this moment I got to you know, uh, start and, and when, what kind of uh, you know, weapons to use, when to use those weapons. So um, the Red Guard movement came to an abrupt end uh, in July 1968. And it was a moment of uh, profound uh, disillusionment uh, and for, this, uh, for the Red Guard generation. And the moment was caught, uh, I think, extremely vividly in a historically recorded, transcribed uh, meetings, meeting uh, Mao, Mao meeting with Red Guard leaders in Beijing. I think that was, if I remember correctly, July 28, uh, 1968. In the middle of the night, Mao decided to call the five leaders of Red Guards in Beijing to a meeting in the Great Hall of the People with all the other leaders um, you know, present, Zhou Enlai, Lin Biao, Jiang Qing, all the leaders present with Mao to meet with the you know, Red Guard leaders uh, in Beijing. So the meeting started, and only four of the five leaders were present. 
the one who was missing was Kuai Da Fu, who was the most important Red God leader in Beijing, but nationally, and he was a leader in Tsinghua University. And the report to Mao was that he was not to be located. He, was, he couldn't be found, because at that time, Tsinghua was in the middle of factional warfare, and he was somewhere, somewhere fighting, but couldn't be found, couldn't be found. Eventually, he was found and brought to the Great Hall of the People. And he didn't know what was happening. He didn't know why he was brought there. So he went in the room, the, the, the meeting hall, and, and saw Mao there. And so when he saw Mao, this is recorded in that transcribed you know, meeting, he burst into tears. You know, he, he cried. And then he, he, he went over to Mao and said, Chairman, you've got, you got to help us. You know, a black hand, a black hand is manipulating the workers' militia, ordering them to crack down on our movement. So we, we are now being, being it's the, because Mao has sent workers' militia to, to stop the fighting. So you got to stop this uh, for us. And what Mao said was the moment of awakening or disillusionment. Mao said, I, I am the black hand.